we have just a little bit more lingo to cover before we can actually jump into the stages of transcription. This really is probably a term that you've already heard me use that is upstream of a gene or downstream of a gene. Um, these are really just terms to say anything that is um, to the promoter side of a gene or to the transcription termination side of a gene. Um, so they're really relative terms. This is true of all of transcription is that all terms are relative because in fact we could look at a gene either way, like we could think about, say, what if this gene was one of two, and there was a second gene that, um, let's totally draw this out, because we could in fact foresee a circumstance where we had another gene on this DNA, and maybe this gene was over here, and I'm just gonna call it um, gene two, I'll just say G2, and let's just pretend that the promoter for this gene was not on this side of the gene, but instead was on this side of the gene. So it's on that side. So the truth of the matter is in order to, to see that construct, that, that region, um, the way in which we traditionally define it, we would literally have to stand on our heads to understand it in the right orientation. That is to see the coding strand and the template strand. If you did your best inversion and you looked at this and you saw the five prime side there, there would be the coding strand as the bottom strand and then the template strand would be the top strand. So the truth of the matter is that everything is relative. It's all relative to where the promoter is. And that's what defines how you look at a gene. Now I'm going to show you on um, a plasmid, which may be an easier uh, way to understand this. But in all cases, the way that we define upstream and downstream is relative to the promoter. So upstream is always what we call the promoter side of the gene. Downstream is always what we call the termination side of the gene. So to write that down in terms of terminology, upstream is kind of what I've highlighted yellow, downstream is what I've kind of highlighted in a teal color. So let's look at this on a plasmid with the concept that um, particularly in a plasmid, which, which might be man-made, you may see genes that some of them have their promoter to one side and some of them have their promoter to the other side. So we have to be fluid in our understanding of how to define um, what is the template and what is the coding strand because it will all be dependent upon where the promoter is relative to the gene. Here we see on this plasmid our origin of replication, of course, and then we see two different genes. So notice that the promoter for gene 2 um, is here and the promoter for gene 1 is there. So as RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, and it heads on down gene one, it's going to use that blue strand as its template strand. It's gonna read the blue, therefore the RNA is gonna end up looking like the red. So time lapse, we get the RNA, and the RNA looks like the red strand or the coding strand in that case. So it's got the five prime and the three prime ends. That's a bad five, let's make it better. Now on the opposite, gene, that is gene 2, again RNA polymerase will bind there and it'll read down the gene, but recognize that that makes the red strand the template and then time lapse and our resulting RNA is going to look like the blue strand and there's its 5 prime side, oh gosh this is going to be hard, I think that's a better 5 than the other one, um, and there's the 3 prime and it looks like the top strand. So notice that what we define as the template and the coding strand all depends upon where the promoter is relative to the gene. For gene two, the red strand is the template strand. For gene one, the blue strand is the template strand. Um, shoot me an email if that doesn't make sense um, and let me know because this can be a little bit of a complicated concept thinking about the relativity of the definition of template encoding. Okay, we're now totally primed. <laughs> that is kind of an ironic term um, <laughs> um, because of the, the role that we know that, that primers play in the synthesis of DNA. And what's cool is that in RNA, 
um, RNA actually, RNA polymerase doesn't require a primer. So it actually self primes, which is really cool. So we're all ready now to jump into the three phases of uh, the synthesis of RNA, that is transcription, and we'll begin with the initiation phase. So just like uh, DNA synthesis, just like replication, we can split um, the process of transcription down into three phases. Initiation is number one, and then two will be elongation, and then three will be termination. Elongation, termination, and of course to begin with we have initiation. So in initiation we already know that the start line for assembly of the RNA polymerase enzyme is right there at the promoter at the TT GACA and taught at sequences and it turns out that it's a special subunit of RNA polymerase that recognizes the promoter. So what's cool about the RNA polymerase enzyme as a whole is that this enzyme is actually comprised of many different subunits. So we we actually have an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, a beta prime subunit, a sigma subunit, and an omega subunit. So hopefully a few of you out there are already realizing that RNA polymerase enzyme has major quaternary structure, right? There are all of these five polypeptide chains interacting with one another to make RNA polymerase into an, a full enzyme that does its job. But what's really, really cool is that one of these five subunits is promiscuous. Yes, it is. Um, the sigma subunit right here, sigma is promiscuous, meaning that it associates with one RNA polymerase enzyme, does its job, dissociates, and then goes off and associates with another RNA polymerase enzyme. So sigma subunit has a very specialized function. That is, it's shown here in the green, I'm just showing it as a cartoon subunit, but that sigma subunit is going to bind to the enzyme and allow it to recognize promoter sequences. You got it. So sigma subunit is like the promoter um, recognition recognizing component of RNA polymerase. You know, it sees TT GACA and it sees Tata at and it's like, oh, hello, good looking. Um, and it really holds on tightly. It has a great affinity for those particular sequences. And it doesn't particularly care much for sequences that are non-promoter. In fact, that's why it leaves the holoenzyme um, when, it, when it gets away from those sequences that it really has affinity for. So it really serves one purpose and that is to recognize the promoter and bind tightly tightly to the promoter and in fact slow the RNA polymerase enzyme at that promoter sequence. So we see that when the, when the RNA polymerase enzyme with its sigma subunit is bound to the promoter, we see that melting. So remember how I mentioned that RNA polymerase doesn't require anything special to melt, melt the, the DNA on its own. It just automatically denatures or breaks the hydrogen bonds in between the two strands of DNA and unwinds and, and denatures that local stretch. And it's about 16 to 20 base pairs. So remember we called it the transcription bubble. So that bubble is roughly 16 to 20 base pairs long. And so the first thing that RNA polymerase does once it has formed this initiation complex is it begins to synthesize new new RNA, that is it synthesizes RNA using the DNA template. So remember how I said it self primes, it doesn't need a, it's a primer, it can do it on its own. And so it synthesizes about nine nucleotides without a primer. So at this point we've got the very nascent process of transcription beginning and in fact we could even draw in here that by the time this is just starting here we have this little piece of RNA with its five prime side and its three prime side inside of the RNA polymerase enzyme and it's pairing, it's just transiently pairing with the template strand. So um, at this point the coding strands pushed out of the way and the RNA can pair with the template strand. So only about nine nucleotides and then at that point the RNA polymerase enzyme moves away from the promoter. That is, it's, it actually does what we call clearing the promoter. And once it's cleared the promoter, you can imagine how Sigma subunit feels about this. It is like miffed at best. It's like, oh man, those were the sequences I had high affinity for. You know what? 
see ya. I'm going to go find another RNA polymerase enzyme that's checking out those sequences TT Gaga and Tata at that are so good looking. So we see the RNA polymerase um, enzyme losing its sigma factor, sigma factor dissociating from the enzyme as soon as that enzyme has cleared the promoter. And this now opens up the rest of the enzyme. RNA polymerase begins its elongation phase. That is, it begins reading the template strand at full force and at full speed, which, by the way, is not near as fast as DNA polymerase. Remember how DNA polymerase revs along like a race car at 1,000 nucleotides per second? RNA polymerase is way slower than that. It's about 40 nucleotides per second. But, hey, don't knock it because it does it all without a primer. It doesn't have to have something else unzip the genes. It is very self-sufficient. I kind of like to think about RNA polymerase as being more like a cross-country skier versus uh, DNA polymerase being more like an alpine skier. You know, alpine skier is a lot faster, but it requires a chairlift to even get up the hill. You know, RNA polymerase doesn't require that, um, that primer. It doesn't have to have something already there for it. Uh, it does it on its own, right? Cross-country skier skis up the hill on their own power. So, um, you know, how many ski and Allergies can we make in, in one vodcast? Hopefully a lot. So now we're ready to go on into the elongation phase where one nucleotide at a time is added onto the ever elong elongating RNA. This is a zoom in at that transcription bubble where we can see the pairing, the temporary pairing of the RNA with the template strand. And you can see very clearly that this is the RNA very transiently pairing because of course there you see where there was an A in the template, a U is incorporated. So this is the RNA. Uh, getting synthesized there. Now, once the RNA polymerase enzyme has passed a certain section, it allows the DNA to re reanneal. So that means that the RNA gets kicked out. And so you've got this five prime end sort of flapping in the wind that is exposed. Um, it is no longer paired with the template strand. So we now see our single stranded RNA that we know to be the product of, of the process of transcription. So this is kind of a quick down and dirty look at that. So as we mentioned, as RNA polymerase moves, the previous stretch of DNA is, is um, allowed to re-anneal. I have a cheesy total B-rate animation that we'll probably want to watch like 10 times because it is so, um, well, I, I don't know, maybe calling it rad is a little bit of an overstatement, but it is very um, descriptive. It helps us see a time lapse of how this process is taking place, whereby the RNA polymerase melts a short stretch of DNA and pushes out the RNA as soon as it has passed through that stretch. Ready? Boom, 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 boom. See it go. Okay, we got we to gotta do it again. Um, so watching that RNA polymerase enzyme clear the promoter and head into elongation, this is the five prime end out here of the RNA. And watch the RNA get longer and longer as it reads the gene. Oh, yeah. Do it again. Yeah, good looking. Um, <laughs> you know, not to toot my own horn, but that is a pretty cool animation. So as soon as RNA polymerase has left the promoter region, the cool thing to take note of is that another RNA polymerase can come in and start a new round of transcription. So in theory, what we could get is something that looked like this. And let's, let's just draw it because we're drawing today. So I'm drawing actually two transcription bubbles because what we're showing is that at any given time, once the promoter is cleared, another RNA polymerase enzyme can bind so in theory, what we could see here is an RNA polymerase enzyme bound very early on and then one bound later. And you can get a situation where there um, is a very short, short RNA just barely being made. And then maybe you've got a much longer RNA here that has been being synthesized for a while. So more than one RNA polymerase reading the same gene at the same time. Um, that's pretty cool to visualize and maybe helps to have a little bit of a drawing. So one, once the RNA polymerase enzyme reaches the transcription termination site, that is where everything stops. And there's actually more than one way in which stopping can occur. Uh, one of the ways that stopping can happen is actually literally, and, and I'll just since we're already, let's add to this current drawing and say that we get 
one of the RNA polymerase enzymes is ready to stop. It's already down at this termination site. And what often will happen at this termination site is something that we call hairpin loop formation. So what actually occurs is you've got your RNA and it's, it's pretty long at this point. Here's its five prime end. It's really pr quite long and it's you know still transiently paired right there. But what will happen is there'll be a local region of RNA that actually self binds. So it's like there's this region of complementarity in the RNA itself and it forms hydrogen bonds in this little local region that forms a little loop. And that loop actually destabilizes the RNA DNA heteroduplex. That's what we actually call that because it's, it's a duplex with one strand being RNA, the other strand being DNA. So heteroduplex, two types of nu nucleic acids in the, um, the double stranded molecule. So we're recognizing that this hairpin loop actually destabilizes that du heteroduplex and it, it causes this, you know, uneasiness, rocking of the boat, and it causes the transcript to fall off and that leads to termination. So that's a common way in which transcription is terminated called hairpin loop formation. Here's a zoom in on a hairpin loop and you can see there the local hydrogen bonding that is forming in the RNA itself. So it's this little region of local structure in that RNA that causes the destabilization. Um, quick side plug, Wikipedia, um, I happen to be able to assess the quality of this image and say, hey, Wikipedia, good job, you did pretty well here. Um, remember that Wikipedia can be a very good source. It's usually just not an ultimate source, right? Meaning that Wikipedia has sources and those are the sources you should cite, not the not Wikipedia itself. Um, although sometimes they do make their own figures. So the other way in which termination can take place is actually called row dependent termination. So what happens with this type of termination is you've got your RNA transcript kind of just, you know, hanging out in the wind, right? That five prime end is flapping in the wind. And if row dependent termination is used, what happens is that this enzyme called rho actually likes to wrap itself self up in this single stranded RNA that's coming off of the, the, of the process of transcription. And so rho literally wraps itself, you know, rolling the RNA around it and kind of tugs, it destabilizes the, the duplex. And so this is another way that we can get the process of termination. I want to end today by talking about whether or not we can make good RNA polymerase enzymes. So let's give this a little bit of practice and look at this example where we've got our minus 10 T, T or Tata at sequence, our minus 10 promoter sequence. Further upstream, we would find our minus 35 sequence. Here's our plus one transcription start site. So we know that this is where the whole thing is gonna begin. That is, the gene is gonna to start to be read right here. So what we might say, and I'm gonna actually go ahead and draw this out. So if RNA polymerase is bound right here at the plus one, start site and it's got this bubble going on. Right, so here's the enzyme and it's opened up this region here. And I'm not showing all of the, the template strand, just part of it. and so on, right? What's gonna happen first here is that this template strand, starting with the plus one start site, this strand is gonna be used as template to build the RNA. So the T there is going to pair with an A, the A, the T with an A, the G with a C, and this is our RNA that I'm showing in red, just temporarily pairing with the template strand. So notice that this looks just like the coding strand, 
But eventually we're going to get to some T's and those are going to have to be replaced by U's, right? Because the A's in the template strand will pair with U's rather than T's in the RNA. So we're going to recognize that we can easily write the sequence of this um, of this RNA by replacing the U's in the coding strand or replacing the T's in the coding strand with U's. So that will give us our answer to this question. So recognize each place where we come into seeing a T, then that becomes a U. So hopefully you're understanding and that makes really good sense. And, you, and that's, that's what, like the third time only that I've talked about that concept. So you got off easy. I, we didn't really talk about it 10 times. Have a fantastic day and I hope that you have a wonderful weekend.